It's a study of both ancient and modern times. It is about the moko of yesterday and tomorrow and a lot of it too is about what is happening now. We interviewed and talked with and listened to well over a hundred people, all of whom were either wearers or artists or both, people who make tattoo, people who have it, are people who love it, but most of all we talked to people who wear it. And it's um, a way of recording our ancestors' techniques and songs and stories. And it's also about capturing the stories of today and having on record what is happening at this time. So that's really what it's about, I think. It is also, too, about celebration, about survival, about resistance, about joy and pain and resilience. What will you find in the book? You'll find um, some fantastic photographs um, of, uh, from ancient times, from uh, different collections around the world, um, as well as uh, from people who wanted to share their work with us. So uh, lots and lots of photographs of people doing ordinary things like getting up to go to work, um, having coffee in the morning, uh, just ordinary everyday day life. Not a book um, with lots of naked bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's not a book with lots of uh, people posing and flexing their muscles. It's a book about how moko is just part of the natural landscape now in, in Aotearoa. Um. There has been change and I think that every culture changes. That by its very nature art is dynamic and evolving and in pursuit of excellence and new directions. And moko is no different. So that from the earliest times of the bone chisels, we came into a period where the chisels were made of iron and then they were replaced by needles, by fine sewing needles. And then in the last century, in the last 50 to 80 years, the, the electric machine became the common way of doing it. Today, in 2010, more and more people are becoming intrigued and excited by the purity and the elegance of chisels again. And of course, with chisels, you don't need electricity. There has been a resurgence of chisels, but predominantly the electric machine is the principal technique. Because it's so black and the ink and the depth of colour is immediate, lots of new designs have evolved. And in very recent times, Many artists are going beyond the black and looking at green, at red, at fluoro blue, at different colours, so that we are moving out of the realm of the ancestral black into more exciting new contemporary forms. In receiving a chisel moko, you end up breathing in rhythm like meditation with the sound 
and the striking of the chisel and the feeling is quite different. Often people go to sleep. The chant that accompanies a chisel moko is very relaxing, very gentle. It is a much easier and more natural process. And so, of course, one does drift off into the realm of spirit. But even with machines, moko can become a deeply spiritual experience. Many of the people in terms of taking on moko um, go through a process of preparing themselves to become a different person, to become uh, an evolution of themselves. And so um, that then starts to link with the spiritual in terms of where have I come from, who do I belong to, uh, who, um, who are my forebears, um, what are their stories, um, and how am I placed within the world. Uh, as well as where am I going to, both in terms of this life and, and the next life. Um, so it then starts to take on a more of a spiritual kind of journey. So three kinds of journeys that people embark on when they take them. In a cold climate, like Aotearoa, you could be in a room full of people who have all got tattoo, but you would never, you never know. know. Unlike here in Tahiti, where everybody <laughs> sees everybody <laughs> with ink. You know, you can't hide. Too if hot. you go to the beach, it's too hot, can't hide. So um, one of the wonders of being here, mm. the beautiful and um, really exquisite elements of being here is that the ink is right in your face. Mm. It's everywhere. People wear it proudly. They wear very little, very light, very cool clothing. So you see the thighs, you see the shoulder, you see the back, you see the neck, you see the breast. You don't see that in New Zealand. Everybody can have this. Everyone can have one of these. But this, you see a woman come in with this and you think, who is she? What has she done? How is she wearing that? The hōtiki, this hōtiki. Hōtiki or Hotewa are the names for this and it's usually associated with women of very high knowledge and um, great achievement or, and this is the key difference, it can be worn by women who are known as puhi, by women of high lineage, but women, young women, women who as usually quite young women have performed ceremonial duties. Mm. And um, she did that. <laughs> when she was 14, she opened a house, Linda did, Waimaria did, which means that um, having puhi status, she could wear this. She could wear it at 14. And you're working on another project. Yes, yes. Could you tell us about, about that? It's an exciting project. I'm a psychologist. I'm interested in knowing about how our rituals um, help with uh, our mental health, help to keep us well while we're grieving. As well as the psychology and the healing aspects of tangi, of the ritual period of mourning for the deceased. Um, there is also a huge enactment of different art forms. These art forms can be a particular type of chanting only ever done by women, not men, only women. Now these are very ancient cultural practices and we are lucky in that we live in a world where that has not been lost. We're also interested in um, the impact of Christianity. You know, how much has the church changed 
what is said. Um, how important is it to have a minister, you know, a pastor, come in and go, you know, <laughs> and do the Jesus routine, you know. How important is that? It could be very important to the grieving family. And what part do, do new technologies play, like the internet? Um, we have instances at home where pangi, funerals and grief rituals have been um, broadcast by, by the internet to relatives by overseas webcam. and uh, by webcam. Um, so new ways of doing things. And another one that's really interesting, um, and we have a fantastic student working on this, mm. is um, mixed, mixed rituals where you get um, Parents, two parents, one's Papa Palangi and um, the other's Māori. Now, when one of them dies, what do they do? What do the kids do? You know, which tradition do they honour? Or alternatively, how do they honour both? Or do they do both? Yeah. And they're beginning to develop a link, a fusion, Fusions, a fusion yeah. of both cultures. Like Samoan and Māori? Samoan or? and Māori, um, of course European yeah. and Māori. But in the Scottish. European it's quite interesting because a lot of people in New Zealand are Celtic, are Scots or Irish and they have a tradition of the wake and of mourning and of looking after their dead and all that. So that gets sort of fitted together. Or Italians, yeah. Italian Māori, Greek Māori. So it sort of fits together, and it's um, it's a really interesting project. We've got a student who is working on it. Lie down, maiden, relax. And let us put colour into your lips. Mutu. For when you go out to the dance party, <laughs> and you will have a really good time. <laughs>